How did the idea of having your own factory come about? Well, I'm not sure where the idea um, grew from, but I always knew that I wanted um, my products made within my own kind of setup. And it goes back to the uh, ambition of scalability. I wanted uh, like 20, 30 machines, uh, machinists uh, that are skilled in different areas. And it, I knew it would be a long-term investment. So this, we, we've been building our factory since, God, um, a decade ago. And the, the machines are very expensive. Um, so it's been slow growth. And fortunately, we, we timed it well where when COVID hit, we had the factory set up. So that was our saving grace in terms of the business surviving through that period. So having the factory is our sustainability promise to our customer that, you know, the product is made in the UK. Uh, we source uh, much of our um, fabric and trims from the UK. We pay UK staff, so we're investing in the UK economy in a huge way. There is less of a, a, a carbon footprint than, than other brands who choose to make abroad. How did you find your studio space? Um, so I found this studio space probably uh, 10 years ago through one of my interns. Um, she had a studio, studio here first and I had to move out of my um, place in Battersea and uh, I, I did think that the area was a bit far because you know Woolwich at the time didn't really have the greatest kind of reputation um, but I think when I saw the space and what you got for your money it was um, it was a no-brainer so I've been here you know ever since. Tell us one example about when God really came through for you. So yeah, I, I mean, I'm um, I'm proud to you know say that I'm a Christian um, within the fashion industry. It certainly uh, has its moments where you have to kind of battle with what decisions you make. Tell us one example about when God really came through for you. So I'm um, a Christian within the fashion industry. Um, I'd say that the most kind of prevalent time where well, there's been two times actually. Um, when I guess God came through for me was when um, my wife and I were getting married. We were at least half of our budget um, short, and this was six weeks before the wedding day. And it was actually my half, funny enough. And, and my wife had, you know, said to me, you know, what are we going to do about it? Which was amazing in itself. And the next day, I got a call from Alexander McQueen their um, production studio to go, go and do some work with them for a couple of days and when those two days were over I asked uh, the management you know do they need me for any more uh, any more days and eventually that work that two days work turned into six six weeks of work and I was doing average of about 100 hours of, uh, a week with Alexander McQueen for six weeks straight and it was leading up to their uh, Paris uh, fashion week catwalk show and literally I was being cabbed home each night because I wouldn't leave the studio until about one or two in the morning and then you're back at work 10 o'clock the next day but, but the great thing about working with McQueen is that you know if you're there past seven o'clock they'll uh, buy you dinner and they'll obviously cab you home because you are one of their contractors so that essentially covered the, the rest of my wedding and that that situation was only God that, 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 you know, that could have, could have happened. How has being a father to two daughters changed you? So I've got two amazing daughters, Nia and Brielle. Uh, Nia is the eldest uh, at five and a half years and then Brielle is nine months. And I'd say having two daughters in particular um, doesn't necessarily mean that you make better decisions but you kind of spend longer in terms of the decisions that you make because because you know that it will affect them um it certainly changed my work-life balance because my working day um is now eight, eight o'clock um i get to work because i have to drop off the little one at nursery sorry at, um, at school and um i finish at two o'clock because i have to go and do the school run based basically in reverse and because of you know i live in kent so it's sometimes quite difficult to come back to the office um whilst i've got um the elders with me so i'll just wait till they've gone to bed to, to come back to the office if i need to but it's certainly allowed me to work a bit more efficiently and um know that i'm building something for them how did you get your collection in shops so i i remember 
just waking up one morning and um, visiting a lot of different kind of small boutiques in Wanda because at the time I was living in Ballam. And um, I, I'm not the most outgoing of individuals, so it was quite a, a feat for me to do that. Um, I, I, I got a lot of no's that day, but then there was a shop in, it was previously called the Arndale Centre, I think it's now called Southside, um, in Wandsworth, where they uh, said, yeah, they'll, they'll stop some of my pieces. Um, so that was, that was a real re reward for, uh, and this was, I think two weeks I was going to different, different boutiques. Then it came to the thing where I had to get the stuff made. Um, so that was quite difficult because I'd never actually had an order before where I'd gone through the process of getting it made and then delivering it. So I had to play like I knew what I was doing. Um, and I made the pieces myself. I think it took about three, four weeks. And um, I mean, we sold a couple of pieces, but nothing to kind of set the house on fire. And uh, eventually I found another shop in Ballam, um, which uh, I got introduced to. And we later developed quite a, a, a strong friendship. You know, I mean, we fell out, but um, we did great business because they allowed me to really develop my clientele, my um, retail experience. And um, eventually we moved out of there and got our own office. So. Tell us about the work you've done in education. Yeah, so in terms of education, um, I, I got into it accidentally because I... I started doing some work with uh, housing, housing associations and teaching their NEETS how to sew. So for those that don't know, NEETS is not in education, employment or training. And um, it was something I really, really enjoyed because I, I realised I'd, I'd amassed so much knowledge over the years I, I had been sewing um, that I guess it was now time for me to kind of pass it down. And um, it all also opened me up to people's life experiences because some of the needs that I taught they had issues with um, their parents um, some of them had um, some of them were young offenders um, and then some of them like there was one project, project I did with Newham College where there were partially deaf students um, and I think that I enjoyed that the most because it was a new experience for me and trying to inter interact and teach them skills that I kind of took for granted because I'd been doing it for like 12 years at this point. Um, and I'd say for the brand, a big part of um, our future is to get into education a, a bit more. How did you up your clientele? Um, the way I grew my clientele was definitely through consistency. There were times that I'd have a customer um, at one point and then I'd, I didn't hear from them for five years and they'd call me and, and say, oh, I mean, you're still doing fashion. And they'd almost be surprised. Um, so it was a kind of thing where I, I'd still been able to make money without you. So they'd think, oh, at least he's, he must be doing something, something right. <laughs> um, so it was definitely a long slog because, I mean, I'd had friends that um, every six months they were uh, doing a new venture. And that kind of... At times that made me feel a bit, I guess, worried about my own achievements, thinking, oh, why am I still doing the same boring thing? But it got to a point where I thought, okay, if they're changing what they're doing every six months, and if I'm still doing the same thing, then I'm probably doing something right. So let me just keep on at, at what it is that I'm trying to achieve, and slowly things will come together. How did your business react through the pandemic and lockdown periods? So our, our business, I guess we were very fortunate um, because it, when Boris announced that we were going into lockdown, that very morning I announced to my wife that we had to close the studio because it was reaching a point where the news was getting so saturated with COVID that you just couldn't ignore it anymore. So um, I remember walking into the studio, speaking to the team, um, all of... All, all of them are actually older than me and it's, it's quite difficult managing people that are older than, than you because it's very easy for them to kind of uh, think you don't know what you're doing um, and I just said I don't know when we're going to open again because you know based on what's going on in the news 
uh, we'll have to just ride this thing out. And we closed for six weeks. Um, I think for three days I, I panicked. Um, I had to call about 30 customers and let them know that, you know, I don't know when your product is going to be ready. A couple of them we had to refund. And um, wh when we eventually started back, we, it, was a staggered, it was a staggered opening. Because we've got two studios, we, we had the space. So we had staff wearing masks. Um, we had um, one staff downstairs, one upstairs in both studios, and then couples still working from home. Um, but I think in the grand scheme of things, we were largely unaffected financially. I mean, we got the support from the government um, uh, in terms of uh, the business rates grants and so forth. Um, but because we had the, the factory service, that, that saved us. Because of the kind of products that we design occasional wear, obviously no one's going out. Um, so sales re really dipped in that respect, but the factory is what kept us going because there was an influx of new designers that wanted to get items made um, and because um, I guess there's more pride in British manufacturing that that's where we benefited. Who is your brand aimed at? So my brand is aimed uh, primarily at professional women. Um, initially when I started in the fashion business I was, I was designing a lot of raven type dresses and I remember when I met my wife she um, she was almost appalled at what I was designing um, and I knew that if I stood a chance of her wearing any of my items I had to um, change uh, the look of the brand so you know we changed the company name it, it was because of her why it's called Emil Vidal Carr even though that's my birth name, she saw the value in it and the correlation between what I was designing and um, the, the name as a whole. Um, so I, I guess the muse for the brand is my, my wife to a certain extent. Uh, the only thing is she doesn't like edgy kind of looks. She's very classic.